was there to say, really. I cared about him. Deeply. I don't think there was anyone in his life that understood him the way I did. Perhaps there was no one in my life that understood me the way he did. He was more than just a brother to me. He was my soulmate, my companion in life. I've always had this feeling ever since he died, this, this feeling of inadequacy. Like I never accomplished enough for him. Like I never did enough. Maybe if I just believed in him more, in his potential as an artist, or showed more of his prints to dealers, or sent him more money. But now he's gone. No amount of money can change that. When my son was born, Joe, my wife, and I decided to name him after Vincent. His proud uncle. Who at the time was staying at the asylum about an hour or so from Paris where Joe and I were living. I remember he would send us letter after letter inquiring about his nephew. How he was, he was getting on? Was he eating well? Looked like his uncle. He was so proud. With each letter of his I read, he seemed more frantic, almost desperate. And I could feel darkness growing larger and larger inside of me with each word of his that I read. I never took my son to meet his uncle. Did I know him? Oh, yes, yes. I knew him. I knew him quite well. I was his physician for the last year of his life, after all. It was my job to know him. Uh, he was a... Oh, he was a lovely man. Very intelligent. Very driven man. Slightly troubled, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, after the incident with his arm, um, well, when he, uh, when he cut his damn ear off, we all know what happened, so I'm just going to say it. Uh, all this talk of madness, well, I, I don't quite understand it myself. You see, what the man was, was uh, hypersensitive. Incredibly sensitive to the world around him. I, of course, put him on several various homeopathic remedies that I developed and tested on myself, you know, to combat his severe depression. <laughs> Come to daddy. Yes. Do you like cats? Yes? That's good. I can't stand people who don't like cats, you know, who are allergic to that sort of thing. <laughs> cats, I find fascinating. You see, on the surface, they may appear distant, cold, seemingly uncaring. But they are like everything else in this life. Devoid of all love and affection, they would soon die. I have 17 cats. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, where was I? Oh, yes, yes, Vincent. Vincent, uh, remarkable man, very, very driven, very intelligent. You know, it, it's a shame, really. Some of his paintings were actually quite nice. But whenever he would go out to paint in the town, all the little boys would spit on him, throw stones at him. 
He sometimes had a frightening appearance. Of course, everyone in town always gossiped about his madness, but in my professional opinion, he was as sane as they come. <laughs> go now, Mimi, go play with your sisters. <laughs> say about him, really. He could be absolutely dreadful, especially to me and my mother. And he's quarreling and causing problems with our parents. I remember, I remember when I was younger, I remember thinking quite earnestly that I wanted to like my brother, Vincent. It's just so incredibly difficult, some of the things that he would do. Shout, curse at me and my mother. I don't think he ever really cared for me all that much. He and my father hated each other. He was explosive. Minute, he'll be completely fine. The next, just like that. Out of nowhere, he'd be in hysterics, screaming at the top of his lungs. He had an anger inside. Great, deep, burning anger to be directed at whomever happened to be in his way at any particular moment. A lot of that anger found its way towards our father. Our father was a preacher, so naturally he was very devout. And he believed that children should behave a particular way. It's not to say he wasn't a good father. He was. He was. He, he just. Well, I suppose he was just never that understanding towards Vincent's eccentricities. He was outwardly very disapproving. His fatherly dissatisfaction weighed on Vincent a great deal, so much so that he himself decided he wanted to become a preacher, to please our father. This is before he had discovered his calling to art. Of course, he couldn't make it through the schooling. And to our father, this is another example of his destiny to be a failure. The guilt. The guilt is what did it. All his life, it was just piled up on top of him, crushing never-ending guilt about everything he did. When my father got sick. Something broke inside Vincent. Any pretense of caring feelings between the two of them was erased, and Vincent would verbally attack our father on a daily basis. With my father's frail health, said it was Vincent that drove him to the grave.
This is the room that we put him in. Not much, rather simple. We, we couldn't have too many objects in the room. You see, he would go into these, uh, well, I don't know what you would call them, episodes. Seems to me to be the most appropriate. He could be a danger to himself. Months would go by with him and everything would be absolutely fine. He could work in a productive manner and, and when he worked, he would work in a frenzy, starting four or five canvases at once and working on them simultaneously. It, it appeared to me that his mental state would move in a series of crests and troughs. For a while, he would be fine. Well, the high point of a wavelength, a crest. And then uh, something from his past would rise to the surface to torment him and send him straight back down to the trough. Uh, his sporadic behavior would cause any kind of abnormalities, uh, like when he, or when he, when he got his damn ear off. I, of course, was not treating him at the time of that incident, but he, he came into my care shortly afterwards. Sampling another one of my latest medicines. What is there to say, really? He could be wretched. Don't you know that? I remember... I remember looking at him when he was in one of his... I don't know, fits. And I remember thinking, am I really your sister? Papa died. Well, it was Vincent, wasn't it? He killed our father. Not physically, but with words. Everything. Our parents. Our father gave us everything. Anything we could ever ask for. He was such a kind man. And how did Vincent repay him? Vincent, everything he attempted in his miserable life was a failure. It's pathetic, really. You shouldn't have wanted to pity, especially me, his sister. And a part of me did want to pity him, to run to him, hold him and tell him that it would be okay. His painting. Well, I don't know where inside him that beauty came from. Yes, I do think some of his paintings are quite lovely, but the grief he put our father through. He put everyone in his life through. If only he could have been more like Theo, my brother. Theo couldn't be more unlike Vincent, from his appearance to his mannerisms. Our uncle managed to get the two of them a job at his esteemed art gallery in Paris, Goupil's. Vincent was fired after only a single month, Theo still works there to this day and supported Vincent and his own family 
with his meager salary for Vincent's entire life. Vincent didn't work a day in his life. He was so ungrateful, always demanding more. The grief that Vincent put our father through, it's unforgivable. It is as if he purposely chose ways that led to difficulties. It is a grim task to attempt to make sense of it. Some mornings, when the eyes are open, life is the color of dishwater. The 
seemingly inconsequential necessities of daily existence take on an unfathomable weight, so much so that the simple task of rising from bed becomes herculean. Loneliness, suffocating. A leather strap shuts off any chance of escape. The remainder of the day stretches out like the route taken by a funeral procession. Is it so much to ask for someone to say that something I do has some kind of meaning? That's all I ask. For love, affection, someone to reach out and touch me without recoiling in disgust and fear. To feel real kindness and warmth. I have no idea what it's like. Until then, I find great pleasure in the tedious. The simple, Repetitive tasks that require a hunching over and a mashing of joints. Hours. Reducing one to a trance-like state. Seconds on the clock cease to transpire, and to distinguish between day and night becomes impossible. Sweat at the brow, dripping down in between the creases and irregularities of the face. Cleansing, reviving, reforming, reshaping. I believe in the power of color, of tone, of texture, of form. They are redemptive, healing. Maybe someday someone will find some kind of significance from the work that I do. If only one person, one person to find some kind of happiness for my paintings, then it won't all be for nothing. Until then, I sit alone in my room. The lights turn low, staring at the blank wall in front of me until my vision blurs and small explosions of light trail and dance across my iris. The meaning that I yearn to feel in my daily life reveals itself in the insignificant. The small, unimportant moments that occur a thousand times throughout the day. Those that pass by without second thought, without first thought. realization that nothing is so important as it seems is damning and liberating, freeing one from the chains of thinking, feeling, and being. It is in this moment that the dark comedy of the human condition is unearthed from the depths of the psyche. The only way to survive this revelation is to accept it with open arms, an escape, a cop-out from ever actually believing in or caring about anything, but understanding what has happened, and looking at one's feet, and accepting the inevitable. The sadness will last forever. When I heard the news that he got shot, I immediately rushed out to office. The doctor said he shot himself, but I can't believe that. I won't believe it. The details still aren't very clear. All that matters is that he was shot in the torso. 
When I saw him, he did not look well. I mean, naturally he wasn't going to look well if he'd just been shot now, was he? When I saw him, shit. He could have pulled through. He could have made it. He spent about a week in his tiny room, just lying in his bed, just lying there, staring at the ceiling, muttering to himself. But of course he didn't want to. He didn't want to keep going. Life was too painful for him. All I could do was sit by his bedside, waiting. Waiting for him to die. And that's what he did. He died. And I was the only one there. 